Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to our Latin America Roundtable, Overcoming Statist Headwinds in uh, Latin America. My name is Roberto Salinas Leon. I'm the director of the Center for Latin America of uh, Atlas Network. We're delighted to see such an a important number of participants that uh, are joining us for this conversation with none other than Dr. Juan Jose Dabub. Uh, Juan Jose Dabub is former finance minister and chief of staff of El Salvador under the tremendous presidency of uh, Francisco Flores and also a former managing director of uh, the World Bank. He is now uh, the chairman of Dabub Partnerships here in Washington, uh, D.C., and has become one of the most important voices in favor of liberty, free markets, and an open society in all of uh, Latin America. He's been with us before, and Juan Jose, it's a pleasure to welcome you uh, to this conversation on the future of uh, Latin America as we head into 2020. Also with us is Gonzalo Schwartz, uh, an old friend of Atlas, uh, CEO of the Archbridge Institute, also in Washington, DC, and recently now also Chief of Operations of the Center for Latin America. Gonzalo, it's wonderful to have you with us uh, as well. So let's go let's get right down to it. Uh, this has been another very, very difficult year for Latin America. On the heels of the Chile setback in 2019 and, and the implosion of Venezuela, uh, later comes the, the pandemic and the tremendous lockdowns and the huge economic distress that the lockdowns uh, have caused, which also generated an opportunity for the autocrats to breed greater authoritarianism including in your own country, El Salvador, uh, Juan Jose, as, uh, as well as uh, Mexico, my own country, and throughout the region, uh, there seemed to be a, a more of a status pandemic or what Enrique Krause called soplan vientos autoritarios, status headwinds throughout uh, Latin America. So obviously the question is, what bodes for us in 2021 and do we have any hope of uh, being able to rekindle the flames of liberty in Latin America? Juan Jose, please. Thank you, Roberto, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be again in, a, in an Atlas event. Um, I think that uh, what Latin America, most Latin American countries have faced in the last few months this year concretely is a combination of, of uh, of, of difficult uh, events. Uh, some are endogenous, that means we produce them internally, and others are exogenous, uh, like the pandemic. Those countries that before the pandemic had done their homework and were, for example, on the fiscal policy side strong, are going to be able to weather the situation slightly better and come out of it in a much stronger position. Whereas those countries that were already in bad shape, both on the fiscal part, but also on the wrong path of, of, of public policies, will have a greater challenge. And as you well suggest, the latest event, the virus, has created the conditions for many governments to exercise that role, which should be the only role governments should have, which is security. So invocating or arguing in favor of security, in this case, as a healthcare issue, they have captured as much power as they can grab, and it's going to be difficult to let it go because they have enjoyed and tasted it. So there are some leaders that, that were already hungry for that kind of situation and others who have become tempted uh, and have taken the opportunity of grasping those additional uh, forces and power. Now, if they were to have that power, a la Singapore, a la Chile in the past, to actually implement the right public policies, remove the obstacles that will not allow people to take destiny into their own hands, then one would say, well, you know what? Let's wait and see. They are taking advantage of a tragic situation in order to do good, because the situation was not originated by them. However, the early signs are on the other side, namely that instead of actually uh, uh, you know, making an omelet out of the broken eggs, they are actually thinking of just keeping the power for the sake of keeping power. And with power comes the temptation of corruption. And that's what we're going to see. That's one of the things we're going to see in 2021. Pop, it will pop up 
here and there, all of these uh, corruption cases related to the handling of uh, the pandemic. Now, is, is it uh, all going to be negative in 2021? No, I think there are some positive things that we need to start looking at and for which we need to work. And that is that given that a lot of the countries in Latin America, maybe rare exceptions, maybe Guatemala, maybe Uruguay, maybe Chile to an extent are in a much stronger, are in a stronger position than almost all of the rest. I think it is a great opportunity for those who, dis who design a strategy to catapult and be at the top of the list in 2021 in terms of opening further the economy, strengthening institutions. So I think that while there is a, a nebulous uh, 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 this year and, and to an extent early next year, I think there is also a great opportunity for those real leaders in our countries to take advantage of the fact that everybody else is not moving as fast in order to become a top country in the many uh, metrics that are available there. Certainly, and of course, your own experience at the World Bank um, has provided uh, a tremendous breadth of knowledge as to not just the policy frameworks that we should uh, develop, but also what are the potential bright spots in the middle of such an atypical and unusual circumstance as the one that we've encountered with the exogenous factors that you mentioned and then the endogenous factors that you mentioned and especially the, the impact of, of the pandemic. And since you mentioned the Southern Cone specifically, there we seem to have a, um, a, a, a case of three countries with very unique circumstances. On the one hand, the puzzle of Chile, where a referendum has been voted to scratch and rewrite entirely the constitution for all kinds of, uh, of uh, reasons of legitimation and, and of discontent and even uh, issues having to do with human dignity. But on the other hand, we don't, we don't want to think of a scenario where they're scratching away the framework that made Chile uh, by far the most successful uh, economy in the entire region and was already approaching second world uh, status. Then on the other hand, you have Argentina, which seems to be following in the footsteps of Venezuela, where it's not only the dramatic fall in, in, uh, in, um, in the economy, but also the beginnings of a new episode of hyperinflation. And then on the other hand, you have Uruguay, not just because Gonzalo is here with us and he's from Uruguay, but it's becoming, I think, a very bright example, not just to Latin America, but the entire world. The leadership and especially that liberal temperament, that temperament of tolerance that President Lacalle has shown, I think can be something to emulate, not just in building a policy framework, but also in giving us hope for the future. What is your view on the matter? I agree with you, Roberto. I think that uh, countries like Chile, which we have seen as example, certainly uh, at the time I had the opportunity of, of, of helping change my country in the right direction a few years ago, Chile was the model. And I think it takes one generation of, of, of reforms uh, for those reforms to consolidate. In the case of Chile, I, I think we are starting to see that uh, maybe we miss some opportunities on social areas, but also in communications uh, that are now uh, somehow creating a little bit of uh, instability, although I tend to believe that in the medium term, the next two to three years, this will be a workout in a much, much better fashion that it could be worked out in some of the other countries in Latin America. So I'm still cautiously optimistic about Chile. In the case of, our, of uh, Uruguay, uh, Uruguay, uh, as you suggest, uh, with a new leadership, with a clear idea, handled very well um, the pandemic, the, the exogenous factors, and in a position to, to shine because it's in the middle of two large countries that are not necessarily moving uh, uh, with the public policies in, in the right direction for different reasons, uh, uh, which, which can also show us, show many other countries in Latin America that it is possible to weather uh, endogenous and exogenous situations and leapfrog at the end of an event like this. Now, having said that, I also want to add something else from the perspective. I, I was a, you know, a minister of finance and we dollarized the economy in El Salvador and at the World Bank, I was always looking at numbers. And what I want to say is that it, several years ago, the issues around conversations like this one had a lot to do with 
the current or the next uh, uh, financial crisis, whether it was Mexico, whether it was Argentina, Peru, Brazil, and we have all the names, the tango, the all the names uh, related tequila. to the, the tequila effect, etc., uh, of, of our different countries. What has happened since then? All, maybe, I mean, of course, Venezuela is a great exception, but most countries in Latin America have learned to keep uh, uh, certain things in order because they have learned about the devastation that happens when you fool around with, uh, uh, for example, your currency. And so in the last 20 years, you haven't seen that pendulum, certainly not in the amount of disparity that it used to take place. And why do I say that? I say that because if we put that in the column of certain mm -hmm. level of achievement, mm -hmm. I think there is a great opportunity to attempt to do that in other public policies that now, in addition to those related to commerce, to trade, to fiscal position of the country, have to also include in an intelligent manner, health and education mm -hmm. in a much more aggressive way, and also the, the, the justice system. And I finish with the following. This country where we are currently living, the United States, the reason it survives uh, uh, and, and strives and continues to be, and in my view will be the best country in the world for the next 200 years is because of the pillar of the judicial system. And to that pillar, we in Latin America have not paid as much attention to. On one hand, because we use the Napoleonic code in most countries and, and we don't have the, the, the a system that is much more stronger. So in short, there are experiences in the past from where to learn, in the monetary policy side, there seems to have been progress. We need to emulate, replicate that in other areas, including health and education. And we need to further strengthen our judicial systems. Excellent. Well, exactly that type of example, uh, Juan Jose, of leapfrogging uh, and of being able to be inspired by some of our successes. I think we could also mention certain cases of trade liberalization and how that has seeped into our culture and is already considered not an ideological battle, but, but a necessity of life for citizens that empower citizens with uh, freedom of choice. So, Gonzalo, um, why does this make the Center for Latin America relevant? Well, thank you very much, uh, Roberto and Juan Jose. Those are always uh, great observations. Well, it's, it's relevant because as we're starting, as many of you have seen that has been announced by, by Atlas, we're starting a new phase in the Center for Latin America, and we're trying to grow. We're trying to be more proactive with partners in the region in order to have more policy impact in order to be able to change the narrative for the better in the region in order to talk about many of these issues that we that Juan Jose has been discussing obviously especially rule of law and judicial matters but also also focusing on a narrative that not that we're steering away for anything related to economic or individual freedom but a more I suppose mainstream narrative in that sense that would be that we'll be able to include many of our ideas already uh, in, in this conversation and be able to support partners in the region you know, to have more impact in terms of policy and in order impact to influence the public and policy conversations. So when I say that we're thinking about issues that we want to partner more with think tanks in the region around social mobility, innovation, entrepreneurship, uh, certainly trade, and as we, as we just discussed, uh, rule of law, so we will be more proactive and we'll definitely have more follow-up calls and conversations with leaders in the region. So we're always, and we're always wait, uh, always have the, the door open or Zoom open in this case for um, to engage with many parties in the region and see what projects do you want to collaborate with Atlas on, but definitely we'll be very, very proactive in that sense. And we'll also reach out and point to different opportunities. Some of the products that we have coming for for 2021 include uh, a, a newsletter specifically focused in the region dedicated to influence that conversation with policymakers, thought leaders, and it will be a great partnership with think tanks and more, more on that to follow up soon. We'll try to, we are definitely have now grant, grant opportunities focused on human dignity and, uh, and more impact driven projects that we want to partner with. But what we'll try to do also is support the groups in accelerating policy victories and accelerating policy conversations and have a project specifically geared 
to having people like Juan Jose or others who have reformed in the past be able to advise think tanks on what could be on a sounding board for proposals, but also going to the to countries where think tanks uh, have the opportunity to pursue reforms and be able to advise them more. But that's more information on that will come soon. But I think it's a, it's a great opportunity for us because there is obviously a lot of pessimism, pessimism in the region. We've seen uh, many bad things happen recently with, in the case of with the referendum in Chile, uh, certainly in Bolivia, in, in Peru just yesterday or two days ago now. Um, so there is a lot of pessimism, but I think it's also a great opportunity for us to step back and strategize a little bit more and have more bottom-up partnerships and solutions with the partners in the region. So that's what we're aiming for uh, for 2021. And I think this, this issue of the policy accelerator and the idea that we can try and help our partners in bringing together uh, great minds with uh, tremendous knowledge like Juan Jose Dabub to give us advice, not to give us a blueprint that somehow is going to be imposed from above, but rather say, look, we were able to do it with uh, the cycle of currency devaluations and inflation. We were able to transition into a climate of price stability in the vast majority of our countries. We were able to open up free trade when it was all about how the gringos were going to eat us all up. And no, it was demonstrated that in Central America, that in Mexico, that in Colombia, that in Chile, and then in the great majority of our countries, we were able to trade at the very same level of competitiveness and circumstance. So now we can do the same thing with that pillar uh, that Juan Jose Dabub explains with the, the rule of rights, the rule of law, equality of opportunity, with uh, a secure and well-defined property rights, which is clearly a challenge that we need to rebrand and to couch in terms of human dignity, in terms of uh, social mobility, which is a topic that Gonzalo has stressed a great deal, and innovation, Juan Jose, which you yourself have, have also done uh, great achievements on behalf of innovation. Uh, just parenthetically as well, in, in his large and, and um, a very impressive curriculum. Juan Jose was also the founder of the Global uh, uh, Adaptation Institute, Adaptability Institute, now at Notre Dame, with some of the most intelligent approaches to, to the issues of climate change and uh, of, of environmental policy that, uh, that we can see today. But that shows you exactly the type of thinking that we are trying to promote uh, here at the center of Latin America. Now we take very seriously a column that was written in April in the Bellow section of The Economist saying, despite the pandemic, despite the crises that we've seen all around us throughout the year, this should be Latin America liberalism's hour. Perhaps in our closing minutes that we have, Juan Jose, you could explain how you see this calling. It's a compelling call to action and precisely how we should follow up and what we can do at the center and with our partners in order to further this cause and do make 2021 liberalism's hour in Latin America. So uh, Roberto, uh, it is very important to recognize that we have been here before. In other words, just to give you an example, in the case of, of my country, El Salvador, in the 70s and 80s, we have almost 5% of our population killed by the war, 22% of our population migrated outside, uh, came primarily to the United States. 90% uh, of the infrastructure of the country was destroyed. El Salvador had zero credibility. And yet, in 1992, we signed a peace agreement. And by 1998, that's six years later, El Salvador was investment grade, second only to Chile. That situation we lived in. And by the way, I went to Iraq while I was in the World Bank and we were trying to do some of those things as well. So you can take the most complex situation, the most difficult country, and there is a way, when there is a will, to revert that situation. And I always argue that the key to this is to have the right leadership in place. Because most of the public policies that have succeeded are already known. It's very little what one has to invent or further polish. So whether you look on the economic side, on the social side, you can pick and choose the best models and examples that are out there. And then you need to adequate them, adapt them to the reality of each country. But I would argue that most, except perhaps on the judicial system, uh, that I want to be disruptive there because I think some countries should attempt to go from uh, you know, a, a, a presidential model to a 
to a congress to a parliamentarian kind of model just to disrupt for 25 or 30 years but that's for another conversation but for what we are talking about i think most of what needs to be done is out there the key is to identify that leader that will be able to take uh, uh, and give the right steps and whomever that is whether it is la calle in uruguay whether it is uh um, somebody in Guatemala, somebody in Chile, a surprise in another country in Latin America, who takes that flag and carries it forward, will be part of that new generation of leaders that know that economic freedom works, that strengthening institutions work, that when you uh, remove the obstacles for people to take destiny into their own hands, things succeed. And in this round, in this round, because we already did some of these things in the past, technology will play a, an extremely important role because what used to take, I don't know, five or six years to do in terms of reform, I argue that it can be done much faster because with technology, you can overcome a lot of the regulation, for example, that exists in many places. We were talking about telecommunications, for example, the big issue at the time was privatizing state-owned enterprises because regulation was excessive. Well, today, it almost doesn't matter what some countries are regulating uh, because technology already uh, breaks the system and disrupts the system. So it's a long answer, but the short idea that I want to stay in people's mind is that it is about having the right leaders in place to have the will and to be able to acquire, whether internally or with the support of other organizations, the knowledge that is needed to implement solutions that work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juan Jose. And Gonzalo, uh, this uh, speaks precisely to one of your topics, which has been achievement and meaning and how that leadership is supposed to recognize that meaning. What can you tell us about what we're doing and about these perspectives uh, in terms of uh, what is out there and what we plan to do in 2021 for the center and what bodes for the region at large? Yes, thank you very much, Roberto. Yes, these are these are definitely challenging times, but I also see a lot of uh, opportunities and there are some key questions that I think will be interesting to see in many countries in the years to come. Well, specifically now, we have to see how the country, con countries come out of the pandemic, how they can rebound in their economies. And if they're making their labor markets and just their economies more in general, more flexible and dynamic. And right now, at least what I can see, and I'm not saying this just because I have my Uruguayan tie on, but one of the only leaders that have been doing some reforms in this regard has been the well uruguay more generally not just the president certainly different ministers and have been uh chiming in and having specific reforms but that's that will be the key how we can make these economies more dynamic more entrepreneurial and what what's interesting also is that some of the left-leaning governments that are coming back let's say in the case of bolivia or argentina or some other countries that uh some other countries more generally, uh, is that they had, when they were very successful in the early two, 2010s or before that, it was they, they had an international bonanza and in terms of international, uh, in terms of commodities and prices. And they're not going to have that this time around. So we'll have to see if they try to pursue some of the, those same policies or if they come a little bit more to the center. Because during those years, it was a lot of focus on, on redistributing wealth instead of focusing on the capacity the, the, to improve the capacity to generate wealth, which is a very different thing. And obviously there's a lot of focus on social plans and all that, but I think at least from, from my perspective, we need to focus on how to improve entrepreneurialism in, in, in these countries because the only, one of the, the only ways, if not the most important way to climb up the income ladder is through a job. And that job comes from, um, from entrepreneurship, from private enterprise, and we need to address some of these issues. And so some of, some of those topics are the ones that we're going to partner with the think tanks all around the region uh, to address. And to that, last, to that comment of that article, I think I wrote on, on achievement, what I try to say there, and it relates to, um, to the conversation, to the talk from Johan Norberg before, and when he referenced the Joel Morkir book on, on the culture of growth, is that what I think is lacking is a culture of entrepreneurship. It's not the culture in general that uh, as uh, Hispanics or Latinos are lazy or we can't do things right. No, it's a culture of just appreciating entrepreneurship in the region, which is different, appreciating achievement. But when there is achievement uh, in the region, we all said, oh, how this 
successful person get there. No, he must be connected to someone in the government. He must have cheated. He must have done X, Y, Z. And there's no appreciation also for the role that entrepreneurs play in that job creation and wealth creation. So, so that is part of thing of the narrative that we also have to change and focus uh, uh, in the region in partnership with all the think tanks that there is that appreciation uh, of, of, of those uh, entrepreneurs and that, and that the attitudes towards entrepreneurship and, and wealth creation and just human flourishing and success more broadly uh, have to change in the region uh, in order to, to pursue more progress, more even economic freedom, obviously, uh, and have more success. So those are the issues that I think we're going to, some of the topics we're going to focus on in partnership with the groups in 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Gonzalo. Uh, we have uh, four minutes left. And uh, Juan Jose, I remember the first time I met you, uh, you stated that, that, that part of the vision that had to be articulated was precisely what Gonzalo was talking about, to, to separate uh, wealth creation from wealth sharing. Uh, one thing is one thing is to create wealth, and another very different is is to is to share it. And there may have to be some sort of intelligent social policy and safety nets as far as wealth sharing is concerned. But it's much more important to focus on wealth creation. And so many politicians uh, take it for granted. The message I take from you is si se puede, as as we say in our countries. Si se puede. We've been here before. We can create wealth. We can be the very best. That, uh, that, that there is in, in our different countries. What, uh, what, what me final message can you give us that we can take? There's almost all of our partners, by the way, have joined this, uh, um, have joined this, uh, this session. So uh, uh, I'm delighted to see uh, so many of us. What, what final message can you share with us concerning uh, Si Se Puede, concerning these values of entrepreneurship and the fact that uh, uh, better days will come? So uh, thank you, Roberto. I think uh, I like to say three things. First, as I mentioned earlier, we have been here before and we have shown that it can be done. Two, I am very impressed by the number of young people that through Atlas and other uh, uh, very important think tanks here in Washington, I have the opportunity of, of meeting and in some cases mentor to the extent possible. And the amount of young people with the, a great number of ideas. We see them often as well in, in, in Guatemala when they come to the Antigua Forum with proposals. That is a great encouragement because that is really the, 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 the raw material that is needed for that leadership in, that I was talking about in my previous intervention. So first, we've been here before and we have resolved problems before. Two, I think there is a, an army of, 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 of uh, young people eager uh, and willing to get engaged and, 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 and resolve things. And third, I think it is very important to recognize that activities like what Atlas is doing, where it provides a platform really for an exchange of views and ideas, but also encourages the, let's get it done. Let's go to the next step. Let's execute a la military, you know, uh, uh, really let's, let's move forward. And I think that's the call to action that you are allowing through this experience, and I would encourage others to participate in events like this, uh, and of course, to move from ideas to put them in practice. Well, indeed, ideas have consequences. We certainly believe that. We have a tremendous agenda for 2021. We'll be telling all of our partners, and, and in our website, we'll, we'll be uh, uh, conveying uh, everything that we have on the agenda. One of the most important items is uh, the Latin America Liberty Forum that was supposed to take place in Mexico City uh, in June of this year. And we had to do it online where you also were kind enough to participate, Juan Jose. Well, now this is an open invitation in front of everybody for you to join us live in June of 2021 at the Latin America Regional uh, Liberty Forum, where the great topic will be the reset, the reboot the, that we need, and that people with your leadership and your inspiration are, are able to inspire. I want to thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Juan Jose, for being with us in this great conversation. Hablando se entiende la gente, as we say in, uh, in Latin America, and it's part of the exchange of ideas that we try to promote here at Atlas Network and the Center for Latin America. And our new uh, Chief of Operations, Gonzalo Schwartz, you'll be hearing a great deal more uh, from him on what we have in store for uh, uh, the Center for Latin America in the end of 2020 and 2021. Again, thank you both very much. Uh, we'll now go to a break and we'll resume at one o'clock with uh, uh, the session on Dignity Unbound. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. Gracias. Gracias, Francisco. Un abrazo. Un abrazo a los dos.